Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus Tecum, benedicta tu e mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, orfu nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hormo fis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii e Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast Mass on this, as we said, the feast, transferred feast, of St. Augustine of Canterbury, transferred from the 28th of May, which of course this year fell during the Pentecost octave. But because St. Augustine is celebrated here in England, uh, particularly as one of our great saints and uh, enjoying the epithet Apostle to the Angles, sometimes translated as Apostles to the English, but that is not quite accurate, uh, so it is that uh, we have transferred uh, the celebration of his feast to the first available day after the Pentecost octave, which falls on this 1st of June. St. Augustine, of course, was famously head of the Gregorian mission, that is, the uh, mission sent by Pope St. Gregory the Great, who according to the Venerable Bede, whose feast was also last week, um, who, according to the Venerable Bede, spotted blonde-haired youths in the slave market of Rome and inquired as to who or where uh, or what uh, these uh, slaves were from, to which he was told, Holy Father, these are Angles, to which he apparently quipped, Ah, we might rather say they are like angels. So, <laughs> so it was that uh, inspired then, and perhaps having received petitions from uh, King Ethelbert and Queen Bertha, or certainly perhaps from Queen Bertha's um, uh, relatives, uh, the Moravian Frankish kings, uh, the north of France, uh, for a mission uh, to the Kingdom of Kent. Um, so Gregory sent St. Augustine. St. Augustine had been prior of the monastery of St. Andrew, uh, monastery which, in fact, St. Gregory himself had founded uh, from the home, the house, the villa uh, of his parents. Um, thus, uh, St. Augustine, of course, was known to Gregory. Gregory member himself uh, had been a Benedictine before he became the Bishop of Rome. And Augustine was sent with uh, a party uh, of other monks, uh, but who were also promised en route uh, the hospitality uh, of Frankish uh, princes and uh, priests to join them who would uh, become interpreters uh, for them at the court of King Ethelbert in Kent. Now, England, as uh, we now know it at that time, did not exist. We're talking here about uh, the turn of the 6th and 7th uh, centuries. Augustine uh, is sent by Gregory in 595 AD. The state of Britain at that time was particularly King Ethelbert. He had become uh, the kind of super king uh, of the Saxons in the uh, south uh, of the country. Uh, the Kingdom of Wessex uh, more or less uh, subsumed uh, or at least ruled anyway by um, uh, subject to, sorry, um, Ethelbert of Kent. Sussex, of course, was still pagan um, and Sussex would be the last of the Saxon kingdoms to convert to Christianity. That would be under St. Wilfrid, of course, co-patron of this mission. Um, uh, and that would happen almost a century later, uh, in around the 680s. The pre-existing church in the British Isles, that which had been, uh, we might say, uh, founded, what of, founded by St. Joseph, perhaps of Arimathea, perhaps of St. Alban, um, the martyr, the first martyr of Britain, but that church, which had become uh, Celtic, was now confined to the northern and western uh, reaches uh, of the island. And so the Saxons 
uh, were pagans. Now, Ethelbert had married Bertha. Bertha was a Frankish princess. The Franks were Christians. Um, and clearly, uh, perhaps more for uh, trade, uh, Ethelbert was interested uh, in having Christian missionaries, especially from Rome. So it was uh, that Augustine landed at Ebsfleet um, in 597 and there went to uh, introduce himself to Ethelbert at Canterbury. We have some recorded words of St. Ethelbert uh, to Augustine that were imparted to him on the Isle of Thanet in the summer of 597. Your words are fair, but of doubtful meaning. I cannot forsake what I have so long believed. But as you have come from far, we will not molest you. You may preach and gain as many as you can to your religion. So said St. Ethelbert to St. Augustine. And so it was that Augustine then began to establish uh, his mission, first uh, in Kent, where uh, Bertha and her Episcopal chaplain had already uh, restored the ancient church of St. Martin in Canterbury. Um, this then became the initial hub while uh, Augustine built uh, an abbey, uh, a monastery, and then would go himself and send out uh, missionary preachers um, throughout the kingdom. Gradually, of course, uh, with the uh, with King Ethelbert's uh, with the knowledge of King Ethelbert's um, support, um, people listened uh, favourably to the gospel and were converted. Famously, on one Christmas Day, Saint Augustine preached and baptised several thousand, according to legend. But Augustine's uh, time was to be short-lived. He died perhaps between 604 and 609 AD, so had not had long to establish anything very much, but had established um, bishops at London and Rochester, and so at least had uh, broadened or widened uh, the uh, territory uh, of the church that far. And of course, uh, subsequent missionaries would continue the endeavour. He had had an opportunity, uh, which he rather spoiled, to meet with the existing, pre-existing Celtic bishops. Um, he offended them uh, by not according them uh, the respect that they felt was due to them. He didn't stand up uh, for them when they entered uh, the room to see him, uh, which they took as an offence. Uh, he perhaps rather mistakenly thought that as the representative of the Bishop of Rome that he didn't have to stand up for anyone. Uh, as far as the Celts were concerned, uh, they had no appreciation of uh, the Bishop of Rome, uh, therefore they expected him to stand. So that meant uh, that uh, relations with the Celtic churches took uh, a lot longer to sort out. And indeed, it wasn't until the Synod of Whitby, much later, uh, that things were sorted out. Nonetheless, Augustine is variously uh, recognised as the Apostle to the Angles. Now, I said, of course, sometimes people say the Apostle to the English. Angles does not translate into English, um, meaning the word uh, doesn't mean English. Um, and, of course, it referred to the Angles, uh, who were the people, uh, the Saxon peoples, living in Kent or the southeast of England. And, indeed, Anglia uh, is derived, of course, is the Latinization of Angles. and refers to the Kingdom of East Anglia, which was a separate kingdom from Kent, technically, um, but, of course, um, was, uh, again, uh, overruled by... Um, Ethelbert. So that, in a nutshell, more or less, is uh, the history of Augustine's uh, mission. Um, if you do a Google search, you will find out a lot more information. 
Uh, it's very interesting, very fascinating time in history. But curiously, you will not find out very much more about um, Augustine himself. Little really is known um, of St. Augustine, uh, who, um, hailing from the monastery, of course, uh, we might say hailed from modesty. There is uh, little background knowledge to St. Augustine. But what knowledge we do have of St. Augustine, for sure, is enough to inspire ourselves uh, for our own generation. St. Augustine bravely, courageously accepted the mission of um, St. Gregory. He was prepared to leave that which he knew and go forth and preach to people he did not know the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of us could we say have the same or like courage as St. Augustine to preach the gospel to people unknown to us? We have reflected before how, as Christ said, a prophet is never welcome in his hometown. And there are those who say that they would uh, find it easier or they find it easier to, uh, as evangelists, to preach in places where they are not known. And yet, and yet, we each and every one of us are called to evangelism exactly where we are. We've already reflected before about uh, proclaiming the gospel in our lives, in our homes, to our families, to our friends, to loved ones, generally to uh, colleagues and to our communities. While it's perhaps maybe easier to go elsewhere to proclaim the gospel to those who are unknown to us, the truth of the matter is that God desires his will to be done at all times and in all places, everywhere. And as the majority of us tend to stay in one place, rather than uh, up sticks every five minutes uh, to go and preach elsewhere, that means that we have to find the courage and the strength and utilize the tools available to us to proclaim the gospel where we find ourselves. And that means, as we have been reflecting recently, availing ourselves of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in order that we may produce the fruits of the Spirit within ourselves, chief of which is charity, quickly followed by joy. So perhaps we ought to think ourselves about our lives and ask ourselves about our Christian lives. Is my life orientated toward and manifesting charity, love toward God and toward neighbour? And is this done with joy? What is the hope that is in my heart? Is it my faith in Jesus Christ? Is it my belief that Jesus is in me? Is it the love of Jesus that I know and have experienced? Now as we've again reflected before, we generally find it easy to recommend to others services and goods that we have ourselves appreciated. Well, without wanting to reduce the proclamation of the gospel to 
a commercial, as it were, uh, thought. Nonetheless, why do we find it more difficult to commend the gospel and to commend the Christian faith to others? If you love Jesus, and if you believe that Jesus loves you, if you believe that you will have eternal life, indeed if you believe that you have already begun your eternal life by virtue of your baptism, if you believe that being in a relationship with Jesus enables you to endure and to live this life despite its trials and tribulations, surely you want others, surely you would want to recommend that to others. For sure, my brothers and sisters, Christianity seems, particularly in our secularized Western civilizations, uh, to suffer some ignominy. We are a persecuted people. People in the West may not yet be calling for our heads, but they are otherwise persecuting the church, and particularly persecuting the church for her history and for her teachings. And what we have to remember, always have to remember, is that the ages and the motivation behind all the church's endeavour has always been to promote the knowledge of God's love and to enable others to experience God's love. Now, for sure, in times past, people had different ideas and ways of doing that. Some were good, some were bad. But that's kind of irrelevant to the contemporary situation where we must ourselves fulfill the Great Commission. And so all our efforts and all our energies, which should always be preoccupied with the fulfillment and discernment of God's will, and particularly for the salvation of souls, each and every one of us, irrespective of our state and condition in life, some of us, of course, have greater emphasis uh, on uh, the mission of the church, um, but we all of us have a responsibility, we all of us should be engaged in the process. We need to find ways, all of us, of manifesting joy, read the gospel and charity. And in discoursing with others, we should err on the side of charity. I know it can be very difficult. But one of the um, impediments, we might say, to the proclamation successfully of the gospel in fora such as social media is the tendency by some of us to rail against the zeitgeist, which on the one hand is fair enough, but in doing so, condemn swathes of people in generality, which is not good. What is especially important is that we as individuals try to speak in charity, with joy, the gospel message to others personally, to others personally. One might suggest that in discourse on social media, one should avoid generalities and instead try to engage with people in a one-on-one. -on -one. And I would suggest deflecting any criticisms 
uh, of the church historically deflect away from those and encourage your interlocutor to focus on this particular conversation with yourself and on the particular experience that you yourself have knowledge of. You can say, well, I don't know about, uh, I didn't live in the medieval period, so I don't know much about the Crusades. I live in the here and in the now, and I know this about what my faith does for me in the 21st century and in this present reality. The truth is, my brothers and sisters, that other forces will use the regrettable incidents of history to dissuade people from hearing the truth about God's love. And we should not allow them to do so. But not allowing them to do so does not mean to rail against them, but rather to manifest charity, to speak with love. So, very simply, if you are discoursing engaging with someone, take, move the conversation away from whatever generalizations prompted the question, move it away from any particular criticisms the interlocutor may have uh, concerning the church, the institution. I bring the conversation always, the dialogue down to you and your personal experience. And do this by simply saying, I don't know much about all those other things. What I do know is the love of God for me. What I can talk about to you is my experience of God's love and how the knowledge and experience of God's love guides me, leads me, influences my life and my decisions today. Bring it right down, my brothers and sisters, so that, to quote, Cardinal John Henry Newman's motto, heart speaks to heart. And this method of conversing you can do not just online, of course, but you can do in person as well. Simply say to people, I don't know much about that. What I do know is my own personal experience of what it is to be in a relationship with God. And you will find, my brothers and sisters, that personal testimony people will listen to. If there's one thing about the contemporary zeitgeist, is that according to its own rules at the present time, it must give, always, it must give way to the subjective experience of the individual. It must always give way to the, to your truth. And that, my brothers and sisters, in fact, is our key into unlocking what many perceive to be a very difficult uh, vineyard to labour in. All we really have to do is do what we've always done. It's 
speak from a position of knowledge, your own knowledge of God's love. Speak from your own experience. Speak to the truth as the truth has been received by you. And in this way, my brothers and sisters, we might hope to continue to realize that ongoing mission of the gospel that St. Augustine was engaged in and that we are all charged with. Let us speak to the love of God as we know it, as we have experienced it, and as others may relate to it. Pray, my brothers and sisters, continually for the gifts of the Spirit. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. And we're not expected to do anything by ourselves but with the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, my brothers and sisters, was not just for one day, nor even for just an octave, but the gift of the Holy Spirit is for every day of our lives, with the purpose specifically of speaking God's truth and our truth knowing God's love in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen